The following video recording has been made possible by Symbotic, complete warehouse automation. From integrated supply chain consulting to fully automated picking systems with progressive financial models. Symbotic systems are deployed in major grocery, retail, and general merchandise operations throughout North America. Learn more at Symbonic.com. And by Duchin Productions. Broadcast corporate and web video production services specializing in science and technology. Start the conversation today. Visit DuchinProductions.com to learn how video can get your business the customers, talent, and investors you've been looking for. Thanks very much for having me out here. Uh, so what I was going to talk to you about today was uh, some of our healthcare robotics research going on at uh, WPI. So this is clearly just a subset of some of our work uh, in healthcare robotics and definitely just a subset of the work we're doing in uh, robotics in general at WPI. Uh, we do have a booth set up in the back that has a slideshow running that shows some of these slides but also a lot of the other faculty research going on in the WPI robotics program. So feel free to stop by or um, you know, come and chat with us afterwards. So probably what do we mean by um, healthcare robotics research, right? Um, so this can be uh, things that include rehabilitation robotics, wearable robotics, pretty much the type of stuff that uh, Connor was just talking about. Uh, let me grab the microphone here. Um, but there's a lot of other aspects that go into this as well. So this can include um, surgical and interventional systems, <laughs> imaging by surgical robots. Yes, yeah, John. Oh, it was working when it was banging around yeah. on the table. All right, is that better now? There we go. Excellent. Um, so uh, it can be interventional systems, surgical systems, image-guided robotic devices. Um, this can be socially assistive robots, so robots that can go into the home, interact with children with disabilities, for example, that can interact with the elderly. Uh, and then also uh, maybe one step we removed from patients is more like uh, process automation and biofabrication and areas like that as well. I think I'll stay over here. Um, so some of the work that we're doing in, uh, in my research group then is very much related to uh, surgical robotics, uh, image guided interventions. In this case, we're trying to put robots that can go inside, let's say, an MRI scanner. So we go inside an MRI, and MRI gives us nice cross-sectional images of the body. We can live track soft tissue. We can track tumors. You can track interventional pathways. You can track uh, objects that you want to avoid, uh, as well as tracking the robot or tracking the interventional device. So an example would be you want to do a very targeted biopsy, right? Um, as you're going and inserting this needle, just like any other tissue, let's say you're going into, let's say, the prostate. It's going to deform. It's going to swell. So how do you guarantee that you actually get that biopsy from exactly that spot inside the tissue that you want to go to? So we need to more or less visual servo the robot to that point under live imaging. And that's why we're really targeting MRI. Also, it uh, proves to be somewhat of a worst case scenario of medical imaging. Uh, anyone that's building robots knows that uh, motors, right? Motors are a steel can, they're a coil wire and a magnet, about the three worst possible things you can put inside an MRI scanner. So it turns out to be a really, really interesting engineering challenge to try to make things work inside the scanner. Uh, on the other side, in surgical robots, we're working with uh, minimally invasive robotic surgery. And you saw, I heard a lot of talks earlier about this idea of you know, autonomy, or even more importantly, supervised autonomy. So how in surgery can we use the robots in this teleoperated master-slave system and some sort of autonomy to help with these procedures, whether it's avoiding a dangerous area, setting up things like no-fly zones, or maybe automating certain aspects of a uh, procedure, let's say you know tying a stitch to a suture or cutting along a certain path, for example. Uh, and then the assistive robotics side, uh, we have some work working with uh, social interactions, in particular working on uh, autism therapy. Uh, we also do have some work uh, with uh, wearable devices, primarily for uh, upper limb and uh, stroke patients, uh, and then this biofabrication work. So jumping into the surgical side, one of the things I wanted to talk about was that uh, example I just gave earlier. Uh, if we're working on uh, prostate cancer interventions, uh, we have a lot of different technologies that go into it. This, but essentially, the idea is we're trying to take a robot, put it inside a scanner, image the patient, use all the preoperative imaging, fuse that to the patient when they're actually inside the operating room, and guarantee that we perform this very targeted uh, intervention. So for uh, biopsies, rather than going in and doing a systematic biopsy, which may be somewhere between 10 or 20 needles in almost random locations, and maybe not even getting the tumor, We'd rather take the patient, find something that looks suspicious, put them in the scanner, take one or two biopsy samples, and get much, much higher sensitivity as a result. Um, in this case, we're trying to put this in the scanner. There's a lot of aspects to go to tracking. Uh, we can do ways to try to control the path of the needle once it's inside the body. And how do we actually bring the human into the loop so we can take advantage of what the doctors are good at, and then in another case, take advantage of what the robots are good at. So a lot of similar challenges even to the autonomous vehicles case. And uh, just so at WP, we're very, very much on the uh, translational research side of things. So this particular robot, we've actually got this into clinical trials now. We've had uh, 30 patients that we performed uh, MRI-guided prostate biopsies on inside the scanner. Uh, so we're really looking forward to taking this to the next step and trying to uh, get this type of a system commercialized. Uh, one step a little bit earlier in the um, development process is the system that we're working on now, uh, funded by the NIH for trying to do uh, brain cancer therapy. So the idea would be if you have a deep brain tumor 
procedure, and this is one that you don't want to necessarily try to cut out, which is a very, very invasive procedure, you could go in and stick a probe, we're calling them interstitial high-intensity focused ultrasound probes, it looks like a needle, you can stick it into the brain and we can actually very, very precisely burn a particular lesion with inside the body. And by doing this inside the MRI scanner, we can actually track the uh, thermal dose and we can guarantee that you burn the exact region that you want without uh, damaging uh, collateral tissue. Um, we do everything from the ground up on the system, developing custom drive electronics, doing all the low-level FPGA programs, doing the real-time uh, control systems, uh, motion, motion control systems, navigation software, communication protocols. Really, from the ground up, we've been developing these systems for trying to do MRI guided interventions, trying to do the planning, the visualization. This here is the uh, thermal ablation probes that we're trying to use to use the um, this a probe inside the scanner. So again, this is this needle here essentially with uh, ultrasonic elements. So as you go into the body, we can actually burn very specific shapes as we're moving this around inside the scanner. Uh, and then try to do dose symmetry. This is really just so there's so much that goes into this, and honestly, almost more than the individual aspects is the uh, systems integration. And we really need to try to get all these systems to work together. And uh, standards is another area that we're trying to work on so that we can, for example, wrap the interface of a given uh, MRI scanner or any really uh, commercially available imaging system so that we can interact with that almost transparently. And this is where our latest system, this picture was actually from yesterday. We're starting preclinical trials. Uh, actually, our animal trials are starting on Monday over at UMass Med with this uh, neurosurgery system. So we're really, really excited to be getting the system uh, into the scanner. And hopefully, we'll be able to uh, hopefully get this into uh, patients at some point in the not too distant future. Uh, and that was just a picture of uh, probably one of the grossest jello molds you've ever seen. But essentially, it's a chicken breast molded into a skull so we can do some of our tests. <laughs> Uh, but why MRI again? I just wanted to emphasize this point. Not only do you get really, really nice anatomical images, we can get thermal images. So by looking at, for example, the phase shifts, we can actually go and we can monitor in real time the thermal dose and register that to these uh, preoperative and intraoperative plans. Other cool things we can do with this, we can do teleoperation. Again, bringing the, the doctor into this. How, for example, do you control it? Maybe uh, the insertion depth is controlled by the doctor, but maybe the path as it's going in is controlled by the robot. How do you do that? Well, there's ways to actually steer the needle as it's going through the body by either changing the bevel or there's other approaches as well. Uh, where more or less from a single entry point, as you're going in, you can actually change the trajectory of the needle and try to steer the path that you're going down. Uh, I wanted to switch gears a little bit. This is this Da Vinci research kit. This is a consortium now of about 25 universities around the world that are all trying to use standard hardware and software platforms to do semi-autonomous teleoperation research. Uh, so WPI and uh, Johns Hopkins and University of Washington are really kind of these course consortium members that are developing hardware and software platforms that are being distributed out to all these different sites to work on these uh, devices. Uh, it includes essentially custom control systems or control racks. Um, this guy over here, but it essentially replaces all the control systems from Intuitive Surgical, but you can plug it into a standard Intuitive Surgical DaVinci robot and you can get complete control of everything that's going on in the system. Um, this might interest some of the mobile robots folks. Uh, we've really taken all of the functionality within ROS and tied it in so that we can use all of, for example, the patch planning tools. Uh, this is just an example of a way to path plan the slave robot on the DaVinci uh, using Arviz and all the motion planning tools within ROS. And we've actually tied this up so that uh, all of the functionality within the robot is now um, available through ROS. You can get it through MATLAB. You can get it through all sorts of different interfaces. Uh, let's skip over that. And then these last couple slides, we're just showing some of the other research areas that we have. Uh, so this is some of these exoskeletons or exosuits that we've been working on. Um, these are from a few years ago, the ones I'm showing in the slides here. Uh, but essentially, this is one where we've worked on the gloves. Uh, we've worked on essentially wrist-type devices, and we've also worked on elbow-type devices. Um, but I think our most interesting and most practical device was really taking this system on the bottom left, which essentially was an entire backpack of actuation system, and you're shrinking it down to something that was very, very practical. This was actually one of my students spent the uh, summer out in uh, Zurich working with uh, ETH and uh, developing a new compact device. So this is a device for essentially stroke patients that they can use and wear around and start grabbing objects. And it turned out to be very, very successful. And you can see the picture here. It's a very simple device. It works almost like a bimetallic strip on the back of the hand that allows you to, to grab objects. Um, that being said, after we built this, we realized as everybody does when you build something, it's not perfect, right? Um, so we took a step back and we're doing this motion study now where we're trying to actually understand how people grasp objects. So we just got the IRB approval where we're trying to get a bunch of people to come in, grab objects. My students have actually integrated load cells into all sorts of different regular objects and it's pretty much we're going to be going around and having lots of people grab all sorts of different objects and really understand what forces do they apply, where do they grab these objects, how do they move, and then feeding this back into the next generation 
Asian versions of these uh, prosthetic designs. Um, this guy's sitting in the back, so this is a robot we just started pilot studies this, uh, this summer, actually, where we have uh, five children with autism, and they've been interacting with the robot, and we've really found that by having the robot augmenting the therapy, not replacing the therapist, but serving as a, an extra agent during the therapy, we got a much, much more engaged um, situation between the child and the teacher, actually. Um, and again, all sorts of um, interesting stuff goes on behind the scenes, so we can track the child, track where they're looking, track their attention, see if they're looking at the robot, make sure the robot maintains eye contact with them. So there's a lot of really interesting aspects that can go on uh, kind of behind the scenes as well. And lastly, uh, biofabrication. You know, how can we use robots to help with essentially tissue construct assembly? And I think I'll wrap up here since I'm short on time. So just here's a list of, uh, kind of our funding sources, our collaborators. Uh, if you want more information, feel free to check out our webpage or the, uh, the Twitter link right down there and uh, come talk to us in the back.